Mm-hmm. All you guys here, I know almost everybody here, a few of you, and I don't welcome you guys that raised your hand for being new. If you find one one hundredth of what I found in this nut club, you're going to do good. This is a good thing. Um, welcome. Glad you guys are here. Um, I'm real grateful. I'm one of these guys that likes being so. This program just works all over and in me, and I like everything about it. I just, uh, and I love drinking. I mean, I love getting loaded. I, I just never found anything as great and cool and powerful and wonderful as beverage alcohol. Um, but this has become more important to me. This, this is the uh, guiding force that I've found now. Uh, this is where I find my spiritual path. I never thought a guy like Steve Dawson would end up saying anything like what I just said. I'm a guy that drink, wakes up, starts drinking, and drinks, and I pass out, and I roll around my puke a little bit, and I pee in my pants, and I wake up and wonder who I've been with and how I got, and all that, like a lot of you guys know about, and blackout drinking. That's, that's how I live. And uh, this is not part of my script. I did not write this part here. I, uh, starting a few years ago, which all changed. And it changed when I came in and picked up a white chip. And my life got real different in a good way. Um, I didn't have a lot of room left to go different in a bad way. (laughs) I was at the end of my strength. A guy told me, here's how it's been for me. There's a drink out there that's got my name on it. It's got steam on it. It's in a a big cup because I like big cups. Isn't it a pisser to go into a meeting and they have those little coffee cups? It's like, why screw through with this? We're drunks, big cups. And it's got it's got vodka in it, and it's got Steve written on it. That's my drink. And it's always out in front of me. Always. It's out in front of me right now. And what happens is, when I came to AA on August 15th of 92, on a Saturday, and I couldn't live one more minute the way I was living, and I picked up that white chip, and I hadn't had a drink since, that drink was right there. That's where I've been living with the drink forever. I just reach out and take it. Because when I think about a drink, I drink. And these guys, I got surrounded by a group of people that really knew what they were doing. They really knew how to stay sober. And they they were no-nonsense people. And they're still sober today. One of them's going to be your main speaker tonight. And they taught me everything I know about being sober. I learned everything I know about being sober in AI. Every single, not 98%, everything. And these guys told me to do stuff like pray and go to meetings every day and stick my hand out to a new guy, do service work, get my nose in that big book, stuff like that, nonsense like that, make coffee. Didn't have anything to do with vodka. And the more I did that, I just started doing it every day because I was desperate. I didn't know what else to do. I'd already tried everything else. If there's one other idea, I would have done it. I didn't have one more idea. That's when we do AA, by the way. That's when this works. When you're emptied out. Gary Knight says, what God would choose to use, he'll first reduce to nothingness. And that's the club we're in right here. And I was reduced to that, and I started doing what these guys told me to do, and that drink went further and further out in front of me. And I mean, I started getting into this deal, and I started liking being sober. And I got so busy in AA, I looked around, I looked over my shoulder, and I got one of those like 30-day chips, and then the three month, and then the, and that had never happened for me. And I didn't. It wasn't that I wasn't mindful of time and not drinking. Every day I was mindful of that. But I was just really into this to where my focus was. It wasn't not drinking. It was the stuff we talk about in our meetings which we don't spend a hell of a lot of time talking about not drinking, if you've ever noticed. We talk about living sober. Thank God. And uh, a, a topic I was very unfamiliar with. And uh, that drink got further and further out, out in front of me. And then I got um, a little, uh, I, I picked up that blue chip, that magic blue chip, and thought I kind of do something. And I started easing back on my meetings a little bit. And I didn't call my sponsor as diligently as I was. And I didn't stick with some of those service commitments or get down on paper life. And prayer happened, but maybe not with the persistence that I had been originally doing it. And I looked up, and that drink was right back there in front of me again. And it was there, and it had my name on it. And I was I could almost reach out and touch it. And I had a little over a year, and it scared me to death. Because you see, if, if I reach my drink, I'll drink it, because I'm powerless over alcohol. And I got busy again. And I started doing all the 
simple, basic things you guys taught me to do. And that drink right now is just over the horizon. It's out there. I don't even see it. But it's out there. It's got my name on it. My job is to stay, stay so damn busy. Loving you guys, being with you guys, and doing this deal. But that drink just stays way on out there. And that's not even an issue with me today. That's really the, the story of my recovery right there. Doing this thing right here. These are the steps we took, Joe Red. Not the steps we understood. Not the steps that we figured out. Not the steps that we asked about. That we took. And um, because of Alcoholics Anonymous, I get to... Uh, do all the things I get to do. I get to be a member of the human race today and I feel like the biggest piece of crap on earth. And, uh, I laugh most of the time and all these things that I never used to do. I mean, I got a driver's license with my picture on it. It's, uh, it's where I live is on there. And uh, today the doorbell rang a bunch of times because I had guests and uh, I answered the door. And my blinds were up all during the day. And uh, I slept in a bed last night. I'm, a, I'm a on the bathroom floor tile sleeper. That's where I sleep. I love cool tile. That hot brow of vodka. Just can, and, and it's right there where you can just do what you need to do and go back to sleep. It's, uh, it's just efficiency is what I'm talking about. Um, all that... All that fun and all that... It, it, in 1991, if you would have told me, Steve, just go... Just go to day without drinking. I would have looked at you as if you just said, just go to day without breathing. I'm going to look back at you and go, I'm a breather. Maybe you can go a day, but I breathe. That's exactly the same as how I was about them. And today, I haven't drank for a little over 10 years, and I don't even remember the last time I wanted one. That's the power, what I found here. It's not my power. I came here because I didn't have any. Everybody, there isn't a person in this room, not one person here, for you new guys, that has the power to not drink and get their lives happy and correct, or they wouldn't be here. They're here because they couldn't do it. That's why I'm here. And this is where I found what I'd always been looking for. I didn't know that I was going to find everything I'd always been looking for in smoky church basements. That's This wasn't my idea. Um, Quick thing, and then I'll sit down. This past several months, I'm, I'm, I did cancer in 98, a melanoma thing, and of all places, it was in my left foot. It's in a foot. 3% of melanoma people get it in a foot. They cut off a good hunk of my foot back then. I was out of the game for about a year, out of work, recovered from that, had meetings come to my house and so forth, and long year, tough year, but it, it, it worked. Got back into work, back into the game, back, back to this. Uh, June this year, it came back again, and I had surgery in early August and another big hunk of my foot, and that's why I'm hobbling up here. I'm off of crutches, and that's nice. Uh, when you're an overweight old guy, crutches are not cool. They're hard, and uh, but if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't have gotten around at all, uh, so it enabled me to get around, and what happened during these last several months is every single day, I... Up until recently, I was on a, in a lazy boy because it was a great big thing wrapped around a big wound on my foot. And every day, people in Alcoholics Anonymous came to my, I mean, not one, not two, not three, people in Alcoholics Anonymous came to my place and hung out with me and brought me food and circled the wagons and rallied around me. And I never for a minute was out of AA. I never for a minute. I didn't get to come here and be with you doing what we're doing tonight, but I never missed AA. Billy came by. Tons of people in this room. I see Jeannie out there. She feeds me. Nothing, nothing is like this right here. Nothing. No group of people. They ain't out there. The Kiwanis Club don't do what we do. We know the grave seriousness of this disease. Everybody in this room, we laugh a lot. Evan Prairie used to say, if they ain't laughing, go to another meeting. They ain't doing AA if they ain't laughing. And I remember that. I don't. I didn't come here to piss and moan. I've done all that. I sat on a sofa drinking vodka, pissing and moaning my life away. All I need to do that. I, uh, I have no way to tell you how much the fellowship of this means to me and how it saved my butt again in the last several months. And the love 
and the fellowship and the giving of these people. I've never seen anything like it. I'm so glad you let me be in this nut club, and I hope to stay with you. Thank you for asking me. Thank you, Steve. And our second 10-minute speaker is Billy O. said a little prayer in the bathroom before. Uh, Alan asked me to give a 10-minute talk tonight. I told him I wouldn't dress for it, but uh, if I'd have known, I'd have put on a collared shirt or something. But it is an, it is an inside job. So uh, a lot of you people are the reason I'm here tonight. Uh, hey, Scott. I see uh, I used to get my, my paper signed a lot when I'd come up here. Is this okay? I get it. I'm an alcoholic. My name is Billy Oliver. Okay, a scatterbrain alcoholic. <clears throat> but uh, I remember uh, about five years ago, I used to I used to come in here and I'd wait till everybody would leave and I'd run up here to get my paper signed real quick because I, I wanted to be sober, you know. And uh, I remember Scott. Scott would always uh, I came in and out a lot and he would always welcome me back to AA. And I heard Steve speak for the first time when I was uh, in a halfway house one time at the Eastway Group and I remember him talking about the four horsemen and the terror and the bewilderment. And, I know, I know I know about that. My home group is the uh, Keystone Group of Alcoholics Anonymous. My sobriety date is January the 28th of 2001. Hadn't had a drink since January 28th. And, um, I'll try to make this, uh, Linda, if I go over 10 minutes, just throw a rock in here or something. <laughs> but um, it is good to be able to laugh today and smile and, and stand up here and, and not know a whole lot, you know. Because when I, when I got here, I... I I, I couldn't say two words. I was so in my shell, and you people loved me, and you told me to keep coming back. And uh, ten minute talk. I, um, I took my first drink when I was in uh, New Year's Eve, 1980, and it was uh, at my grandparents' house in Florida. I was seven and a half years old. I snuck behind the bar. They had all these cokes and sprites stacked halfway to the ceiling, and I think I thought that was real neat. And my sister and I would go behind that, and there was something else behind the bar that that caught my eye. I don't, I don't think it caught my sister's eye the same way, and it was all the liquor behind the bar and I remember a little bit of what was going on you know I was seven and a half years old I remember the sneakiness the uh you know wanting to wanting to get some of that and uh, got in that liquor that night and uh drank about three or four shots remember exactly what I drank I drank gin straight and, and now I know what all those cokes and sprites were for but uh for chasers but uh and I got drunk, you know, I sat back on the fold-out couch, and I remember Times Square or something on TV, and I, I remember the world spinning, and I remember thinking I drank poison or something, and, and that's, that's all I remember about that drunk, but uh, through the years, I, I would take sips of my dad's alcohol from time to time, there wasn't a problem with that, and, and uh, I would sneak beers out of my dad's downstairs refrigerator, 9, 10, 11 years old, and hide them under the bed until I got three or four or five of them, and go in the woods, and sit in the woods with a cigarette or two and three or four hot beers, uh, wasn't drinking for the taste, but, but, uh, and I, and I, anyway, um, uh, my life took a change at the age of about 12 years old. We, my dad's a professor out at, uh, UNCC and we moved out there and, and I, I remember how devastating that was at the time to leave my, my safety and, and my neighborhood and go to a to a whole new school and a neighborhood and everything, and I and I got running around the wrong crowd then, and 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 that, you know that's my story. I I started messing up at a young age, 12, 13 years old. I started drinking and and stuff like that uh, on a daily basis, on a daily basis. And, and looking back, what I know today, uh, I was trying to fill the void. You know, I, I tried to fill it with sports and uh, get involved in that, and um, I had some good times, you know, as a teenager, but I was, was a lost child from the start, I think. And uh, at the age of about 20, 21 years old, I, I started dating a girl. I started, uh, the drinking started getting real bad. I started, um, I started uh, doing a lot of stealing, a lot of, uh, I had my first experience with going to jail. Um, and it got bad. I started to burn all my bridges, and I was cut off by the family, cut off by the few friends that I had. And and when you when you when you burn all your bridges and you don't have anything, and you're all through running, what do you do? You know, you, you do what you can. And there's not a lot of options left. You know, there's and that's my story. It got to the to the point where I 
had choices like detox or the Salvation Army or, or going to a halfway house and uh and uh you know thank thank God for uh, for for places that uh force you to come to AA because I I didn't want to be in AA you know I wanted to party successfully and get my nine to five straight or whatever and and uh but uh you know um I was introduced to the to Alcoholics Anonymous by by you people you know that stuck the hand out and welcomed me here and and uh. And and uh, there was a lot of uh, in and out of places like that, and uh, and in the end, uh, you know, I wanted to be sober, but I could not get sober for anything. Um, I could never get sober, and uh, I, I finally, I finally went to a uh, halfway house at one time, um, about December the sixteenth of ninety nine, I believe it was. I had a sponsor who who told me if I was to do five things on a daily basis, uh, get on my knees in the morning. Ask, ask God for a day of sobriety, to, to read the big book every day, to go to a meeting every day, to call my sponsor every day, and then if I was to make it to nighttime, to get back down on my knees and, and thank God for another day of sobriety. If I was to do that on a daily basis, to, he said he'd never seen anybody go back out. And, and when he said that, you know, I kind of kind of doubted it, but, my, but I was so beat down that I, I really, really, really wanted to believe that man when he said that. And I, I started doing that, and... Uh, I think when we get to that point when we're willing to go to any lengths for sobriety is when it when it started. That's my experience. That's when it started happening. And I I was in a halfway house and I and I stayed there about four months. I I did those things. I went to work every day. I I moved from a halfway house to a three quarters Oxford house. And uh, from there I, I got my own place. And um and I got cocky. Uh, started getting cocky shortly after uh, I picked up one of those blue chips. I started getting cocky and I started slacking up on my meetings and I started hanging out with some old people with the with the attitude that I, I know I'm alcoholic if I <clears throat> it, you know if my you know what falls off I won't take a drink and I drank. That's what happened. It was not a planned drink. I put myself in a in a position with, with some alcohol and some old friends and, and no kind of spiritual program going on and and I drank. It's what happened. Um, I don't know how this happened, but I stayed out for about a day and a half, two days and. You people, a couple of my good friends uh, came to me and, and uh, encouraged me just to jump back in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I was at the point that I've been in so many times of uh, the, the morning after, that remorse and that sadness. That's that's the word, the sadness of having 13 and a half months in this program the night before and then back at White Ship again. I, I, excuse me, I, back at the morning. I had a choice. By the grace of God, I had a choice of either going back out or picking up a White Ship and and I didn't want to do either one. I wanted to die. Is what I wanted to do. But these friend, you people, incur a couple of you people have really encouraged me, and I and I did that. And I picked up a white ship at Queen City, and I picked one into action the night after that. And uh, y'all loved me, and y'all 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 walked with me. And and it was painful the month or two back. I was right back at the beginning again, and it was the fear was back, and un and I just walked through that. And that's been about about 20 months ago, and it's um. You know, the, the difference is, 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 is there's not a big difference. I, I want to be sober today, but the difference is when I stopped doing the deal, I put myself more susceptible to picking up a drink, and and I, I hadn't found it necessary. I've, I've worked the steps with a good sponsor. Uh, my sponsor's Mark R., and he's, he's he's helped me so much. He's helped me so much. I've, I've uh, I go to conventions some. I've been to Veda Mecham a lot. I've, um, I, I sponsor some guys today, and, and uh let me just tell you a little bit of, of what it's like today. Um, I just bought a bought a four bedroom house in Tika K, South Carolina, and uh, you know I've been to detox thirteen times. I'm the guy that was standing in front of the Texaco station, and when you pulled up to get gas, to run out there and ask you for a few dollars, and that's honest. And I can stand up here and look you in the eye tonight and tell you that, and not be embarrassed about that because you know we do not wish to shut the door door on our past. You know our, our biggest scars can be our biggest stars to help another alcoholic today, and and I. Uh, I'm so grateful to be sober today. It's a learning process, and I, you know, St Steve said it. And as, as long as I stay in the in the middle of this program, and I and I try, that's the big word. I try to live this program and and, and walk with you people. You know, I don't have to fear a drink today, but I just I just need to stay real close, take a lot of action, and I'm I'm a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous today. And thanks a lot.
never know what I'm what I'm gonna say when I get up here. That's that's just the way I am. Uh, I just make up new stuff every time. I, and I, and I, uh, I I'm the kind of drunk I have I have the kind of ego that I want to do. You know, I want to just start out with something very profound and just build from there. And and uh, and I want you to go away from here with tears in your eyes and hope in your heart. You know, but. Uh, God intervenes, as he always has, and, and, and I'll just try to, to, to the best of my ability, to share my experience, strength, and hope. You know, you had two that preceded me here that I really don't need to say a heck of a lot because they told about, you know, uh, what my theme will be. That, uh, just to elaborate on a little bit of what they said is Alcoholics Anonymous has done for me as much as any other drink or drug or anything else has ever done me. You know, all I ever wanted in life was to be rich and well thought of, you know. And that's all I ever wanted. It's quite simple request, you know. And, uh, and, and when that didn't come about, I turned to other things, you know, so that I could feel that way. And, and, and I think that was in the searching, you know. We searched for that, you know, that thing that's spiritual and and uh, since I couldn't be rich and well thought of, I, I used substances to, uh, you know, to help that. And uh, but Alcoholics Anonymous does, you know, it, it makes me feel good. Uh, it gives me riches far beyond what I ever dreamed of. Uh, it, uh, you know, and speaking of well thought of, I was talking to a couple friends before the meeting, and you know, I, I could just, uh, I could screw up real royally up here and, and it really wouldn't matter because you folks love me and I know that you know and, and you know what security that is and, and and that's just the way we are here you know we, we, we stay sober to help help one another and uh and you know like Steve said you don't find that in, in society you know we're uh we genuinely care for one another and uh and that's all I ever wanted you know that's just you know, somebody to care for me, and, and I could care for somebody. You know, when I came here, I was just full of resentment. You know, I resented everybody that wanted uh, the best for me. You know, that which is family, uh, people that love me most. You know, I resented them because uh, they they would talk to me about the way I behaved, and they, and I didn't think I behaved all that badly most of the time. But you know, I, I would get in these. I had very bad luck, you know, I'd get in trouble, and, and, uh, and they didn't understand, uh, uh, and, uh, but, uh, I, I always like what Melanie S. said, you know, she said, uh, that somebody had an intervention on her, and she, she called it a betrayal, you know, and, and, and I love that, because I think that's the way most of us are when people start talking about our drinking. But we get here to Alcoholics Anonymous, and, and you know, nobody talks to us about their drinking or talks down to us or say, you know, if you do this, uh, if you love me, or, you, you know, they tell about their drinking. And, and, uh, and what a profound idea, you know, that, that I can listen to somebody talk about their drinking, and I'll say, that sounds like me. And that's the way I related, you know, the very first time. Uh, now, i got to tell you a little bit about me, uh, uh, Denise saw me coming in. And she said, "You just spoke here, didn't you?" And I had to think for a minute, you know. Uh, but my wife did, and uh, she told my story if it was any good. Uh, so, uh, but I got to tell you a little bit about me. I, I was thinking about when Steve was talking about how he's a, a dress right uh, on, on his license. My dress. Uh, until I was 35 years old, was 1101 Central Drive, Concord, North Carolina. Now, by that time, I'd been married twice, had two children, and my address was still the same. Now, figure that out, you know. Uh, the last couple of years, from the time I was 33 to 35, I hadn't lived there, but that was still my permanent address, and that was my parents' home, you know. Uh, uh, I, I like to say I grew up too fast, and I left their home when I was 32. And uh, but I needed that, you know. I I, I had to have that. I, somebody needed to look after me because I certainly couldn't do that myself. I always thought I could, but I couldn't. 
Uh, my sobriety date is June 25th, 1983. And for that, I'll be, I, I, I can't express enough gratitude for that. Uh, I've stayed around for a while. And, and thank God. Because I've got the mind of a chronic alcoholic, and you'll hear that in my story, you know. That chronic alcoholic mind is constantly trying to get me to sabotage my well-being. And that's why I need you more today than I've ever needed you. Because if I would somehow lose my grip or lose sight of what I'm trying to do, I'd be in a heck of a lot of trouble. Uh, And I know that today. But those old thoughts, those old ideas, those things, you know, they'll just keep popping up. They pop up all the time, you know. And I've noticed if one of my character defects manifests itself, and they do, don't get me wrong, it, it's like a, it's almost like dominoes, you know, the next one to do it, the next one, the next one, you know. First thing, you know, I'm cheating, lying, stealing, all that stuff, trying to cover my tracks, and uh, for what? You know, what do I have to fear today? All the fear I've lived through all my life, what do I have to fear today? Because I have you, and, and, and you know, that's that's just, you know, what security that is. Uh, I'm here by the grace of God, I do know that, and only God's grace. Uh, now, I, I do have the program of Alcoholics Anonymous in my life, and I do have you in my life, but God's grace is, is what I rely on, I really do, because uh, I can know that book inside out, but this alcoholic mind will cause me to do things, and God's grace, I think, keeps me from doing the things that I shouldn't be doing sometimes, and, and, you know, that's just a fact, that's that's my opinion. Uh, I grew up over here in Concord, as I said, 1101 Central Drive, and uh, my folks worked in a mill, and uh, as a child, I was embarrassed that they worked in the mill. Uh, I don't know what I would have wanted them to do. I would have probably been embarrassed had they owned the meal, you know. But uh, that's just the way I was. I was embarrassed by our home, and our home was as good as any home in the neighborhood, you know. But I was embarrassed by it. Uh, I didn't drink very early, like Billy, you know. Uh, I, I started kind of late in life. I was. Uh, 16 years old before I ever felt the effects produced by alcohol. And uh, that's kind of late by today's standards. I have seen people around here in Charlotte. I've met 16 year olds had a couple years of sobriety in alcoholics and all. But, uh, but the reason I didn't drink, my daddy was a loud, hard drinking, profane, you name it, he was. Uh, and he scared me. Now, we had, we, I had a love-hate relationship. I wanted to be just like my daddy. I was scared to death of him, but I wanted to be just like him. Tell you what, tell you what my, my daddy was like. Uh, some of you may remember this. Uh, I don't see very many rednecks in here. I, I can't, but, uh, uh, in rural counties like Cabarrus, Rowan, standing up, they'd have dance halls, you know, and People would go there on Friday or Saturday night, and there'd be big crowds there, and there was no alcohol served, but everybody there was drunk, you know. And, and, uh, when my daddy was 59 years old, he got in a fight in one of these places. And I thought that's pretty cool, you know, a man that old, you know, getting doing that. Uh, but that's the kind of relationship, you know, that I had with him. I thought that those sort of things were great, but I was afraid of him. I, I didn't think he was a very good father. He was a heck of a lot better father than I, I have been. I can assure you that because uh, he he took he did things for me that I probably would not have been able to do in my alcoholism for my children. Uh, my mother, on the other hand, was petito. She never had a drink in her life. And she was a very spiritual person. She had a program. She practiced it daily. It was in her Bible. She practiced it much like we do here at Alcoholics Anonymous. It's by attraction rather than promotion. I always thought my mother was a little country girl. Didn't know much about the ways of the world like this cosmopolitan guy did. But uh, uh, when she died, the, the, the 
the church overflowed, you know, people paying respects for that's what the community thought of, you know. Uh, I never appreciated her as much as I should have because, uh, truth be known, my mother almost loved me today. Her love for me nearly killed me. And mothers do that. You know, you mothers sitting out there, you, you, you've caught yourself in those sort of things if you have, have a child like me. And, uh, but she almost loved me to death. And, uh, but, and, and that's the home I grew up in. And I played sports. You know, for years, sports was my alcohol. I played sports year round, played football, basketball, baseball. In the summertime, I, if I went from Little League Baseball to, to Babe Ruth League Baseball, to Legion Baseball. And then when I went off to college, I stayed in summer school. So I never worked. Uh, daddy always, my, my daddy was very sarcastic when he talked to me. He'd say, Things like, if somebody offers you a job, I want you to come tell me because I'm going to go whoopies, you know what, for insulting my son, you know. And, and, and that's the kind of dialogue, I, you know, I grew up with. Uh, but but I played sports, and uh, and I didn't have time to work. And uh, uh, I was a dreamer, too, you know. I, I don't know if y'all were, but I, I had a vivid imagination. You know, I imagined myself being this or that. And I liked sports heroes. So there was a guy that played football for a, a university just south of here. And, uh, he, he had blonde hair like me, and he was a flashy player. And, and I could I imagined myself being like this guy. I said, I, I want to be just like him. And, and I kind of imagined myself that way. And... Uh, and I was going to play at that school and be the, the next, you know. And uh, so as time rolled around, that almost happened. But I'll tell you a little bit what, about what happened before then. As I said, I didn't feel the effects of alcohol until I was 16 years old. And I used to say this was a social drinking, but I don't think social would apply because I stole the alcohol you know, that I drank. And so I don't know if you can classify that as social or not. I ran a red dot store in uh, Ocean Drive Beach, South Carolina, stole a pint of Gordon's gin off the shelf and took off running. Uh, as I said, I played sports. If they chased me, I don't know if they didn't catch me, you know. And uh, and I drank a little, some of that Gordon's gin and I felt like I was about to lose control. And it scared me. And I stopped. And uh, some guy said, are you okay? And I assured them that I was fine, uh, which I would say that a lot in, in the years to come, but uh, and, but I felt like I was going to pass out, I, I, you know, that everything was spinning, and, and it scared me, so I didn't drink any more that day. I'm sure I probably drank the rest of that pint. Now, the reason I had not drank up until this point was I was afraid of my daddy. I was afraid of his brand of discipline. You know, I, I didn't know what it was like I was was away, you know, at the beach with a group of guys, and it was kind of accepted there, so we, you know, that's that's what got me started. Well, I don't recall drinking any more until the next year, same time, same place, same group of guys, and I'd already felt the fear this time when I drank, uh, the magic happened. And that's why I'm standing behind this podium tonight, you know. And I, I don't have to explain it to you, you know, if you're an alcoholic. And, and I thought I saw 100% of hands raised when, when the question was asked. You know what I'm talking about for a little bit of time. You know, because I'd been in a world that, that I thought was cruel. You know, I, did, I didn't think I ran around with the right people. You know, they, they were there, and I was here. You know, looking back on it, I ran around with the right crowd, everybody that, you know, uh, I was as socially popular as anyone around, but I didn't think it. I have a disease of perception, and my perception was, you're different from them, you'll never be as good as, you'll never be, and, and, and that's the way I walked around on it, and I, how do you tell people that? You don't tell them that when you're 16 years old, especially if you're a big shot football player, or basketball player, or baseball, you can't tell that kind of stuff, that's the way I felt. But there for a brief period of time, all that didn't matter. It was out the window or forgotten or whatever. And I blacked out and I passed out and I puked and I did other things. And and uh, But it was wonderful. And I couldn't wait for that to happen again. 
And so, uh, came back and like I said, I, I, I was, uh, I played ball and, uh, uh, I'm sorry I read so many people out, but, uh, my rhythm there for a minute. Uh, but in my senior year, and I, and I tell you this, I tell you this because I don't want to brag. Uh, I don't want you to think I'm bragging about my athletic prowess. Well, it was just I want to tell you a little bit about alcoholism at 18 years old. My senior year, I began to get scholarship offers from all the major universities in this area and, and all the small colleges and everything, and 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 that dream I'd had as a child to be the next guy down at that university in Columbia, South Carolina, was right at my fingertips. It was about to happen because they had offered me a scholarship. And uh, I'd taken the college boards late. Now, I've got to explain this, too. You know, drunks are good at explaining, you know. <laughs> if, you've ever been, if you've ever been to court on a drunk driving charge, you know, uh, they ask you guilty or not guilty, and you say guilty with, with explanation, you know. And, well, you know, we have to explain where we are, you know. And, and uh, when, as a child, till I was 12 or 13 years old, I made all A's. I might have made a few B's, and, and that disappointed my mother if I made a few B's. But once girls started looking differently, and I don't know what that has to do with anybody, but that's when my grades fell off. And, and so I, it, it, they never were quite as important from that point on. And like I said, I was doing other things, playing sports and things like that. I didn't have real good academic credentials when I was you know, graduating from high school. And, uh, and I'd taken the college boards late. And I was about eight points shy of making enough. And it was being an out-of-state student. I'd have been fine here in North Carolina, but that's where I wanted to go to school. I was eight points shy of having enough on the college boards. So they set it up so I could take the test in Columbia on June 20th after I graduated from high school. And I was ready to go down and take, take the college boards. And uh, my best friend came home, my next door neighbor. In fact, there was a Baptist church between my house and his house. And we both grew up in that Baptist church. And he's on in the Baptist church a couple of years earlier. He came home and he had a brand new four beds. He had six bottles. On them imperial courts, I think they're probably leaders or something like it. Biggest bottle of liquor I'd ever seen in my life. And uh, he said, let's go to the beach while I'm home. And I said, Bill, I can't. I've got to go take the, those college boards tomorrow in Columbia. But, uh, you know, maybe we can go when I get back. So we put our brilliant minds together. We decided that he'd drive me down there and I'd take the test. And we'd go on to the beach from there. That way we wouldn't have to waste any time. And uh, so we take off for Columbia. It's a nice summer afternoon. We got the top down on that Corvette. And I always pictured myself, fancied myself to someone who should ride around in a Corvette, drink the best liquor and plenty of it. You know, there were six big bottles. And, uh, and it, it was just a fine summer day. And uh, we were going to pick up some girls when we got down to Columbia. And, and I remember later in the night, uh, I was agitated about something. Uh, some girl must have said something to me or something or didn't respond to me. And, or I could have been too charming or something. I don't know what it was. But I remember being agitated. We hadn't picked up any girls, and it's about 3 o'clock. And, uh, and I told Bill, I said, let's go on to the beach. And, and the significance of that, you know, I've, I've looked back on this. The significance of that is... There was a childhood dream right at my fingertips. Uh, and I was willing to sacrifice it to drink beverage alcohol. And I'm settling for second best to drink beverage alcohol, and I settled for second best from that point until I walked into the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't know that, but that's what I was doing. You think about it. And, uh, but life goes on, you know, we made, Beach Bill drove down there in a blackout. He didn't even remember driving down. It uh, scared me to death when he told me that. Uh, I don't know that he ever found this program. Uh, but life goes on. I went to a fine university here in this state, but I was resentful the whole time I was there because it wasn't where I wanted to be. Yeah. And, and 
and uh, and I got a lot of attention uh, uh, for playing ball. And, uh, and when you're drunk like me and you have an ego like me, you don't need a lot of attention. You know, I, like Bill Wilson said in his story, I had arrived at, at 18 to 19 years old. I was omnipotent. I didn't need anybody for anything. Now, mind your mother was sending me money every week. Uh, I got married very early on. Uh, had a child. My wife, uh, my wife and my son moved in with my parents. There was another child born. Uh, they lived with my parents. I stayed in school. Stayed in school all year round. Party. Just had a ball. I was a husband and father. Didn't want the responsibility of either. Didn't know how to handle the responsibilities of either. Uh, made it into my senior year in college. And, just barely. I was on academic probation the whole time, from the time the first grades came out until I left. I was on academic probation the whole time. Uh, got into some trouble here and there. Uh, arrested first time when I was 21 years old uh, over in Asheville. And uh, came home. I was, what had happened, I wasn't going to enough classes to stay in school in the last quarter I was in school, and so I had to come home. Now, I didn't come home right away because uh, I had things to do up there, so I got a job up around school, and I got fired for not showing up to work, so I had to come home. And uh, so I came home, I'm planning on going back to school the next quarter, and it took a little while. I finally did graduate from college, but it took a while. But uh, there I was at home, and you know, I had a wife and two children there at my parents' house. I didn't think anything about that. And Daddy kept saying things like, you're going to have to get a job and get out of here. And he meant a job in the mill or something. And I thought because I was a senior in college, I should at least have some sort of executive position somewhere. Consequently, there weren't many executive recruiters coming by that beer joint I was hanging out all the time. And uh, But like most Good drunks. We had that system of enablers, and the friends, families got me a job selling insurance, and I knew a lot of people. I sold a lot of insurance. I was good at it. Just wasn't too good with handling the money or stuff like that when people would send money to me, and uh, six months later, they fired me for embezzling money, and that was the beginning of my professional career. <laughs> it didn't get much better. Uh, I quit drinking on a New Year's resolution when I was 24 years old. About the same time, uh, I landed the job of my dreams. Uh, it was sports editor of the local newspaper there in Concord. And, and I loved the job, and I was good. It, it was my cup of tea. I could write sports real well. And uh, I, I just loved every, every moment. And... For a while in that job, I didn't drink because I'd quit drinking. And uh, about mid-April, uh, the local race season started around here. The, they had dirt tracks. They started about mid-April. Well, two guys that worked for me and me were coming to Gastonia to, to cover the race. And uh, they stopped in Charlotte, got a six-pack of beer. Uh, Cabarrus County was dry then. And, uh, and I thought, well, I haven't had a beer since January the 1st, and I could probably drink a beer. See, I didn't know anything about the obsession of the mind or the allergy of the body. You know, I didn't know about the phenomenon of craving. They didn't talk about that at the beer joint where I learned everything that I knew. But, well, they might have. I, I may have just not been ready, but, you know, I, I don't think I ever heard them talk about the, the obsession of the mind the allergy of the body. So when I, I said, well, I can... I'll get me a six pack, and uh, so I did. And you know the story. Once I took one drink, I said, "Forget you and I don't drink." And that's the fact. Uh, my six pack is gone, but I've got the gas on. I started on theirs, and uh, theirs was gone pretty shortly. And I said, "The heck with this race. Let's get back to Charlotte." You know. And I did what I did every time I did that. I stayed out all night. Didn't make it to work on time the next day, and I was the talk of the news for you know, everybody's, you know, and they were kind of laughing about it then, you know, because that, they didn't think I drank, and I didn't, you know. Well, it got worse. 
And it just seemed like the publisher called me in his office every Monday. It might have not been every Monday, but it seemed that way. And he'd say things like, Lee, you can't behave the way you're behaving out in the community. You represent us. And I'd swear to him, you know, I'd say, Mr. Huckle, I'll never take another drink as long as I live. And he'd look me straight in the eye and he said, I believe you. I can see the conviction in your eyes. He could. We drunks do that. You know, we believe that lie ourselves. And that's why we're so convincing. When that man had to fire me, he cried. You know, he was genuinely hurt. I was madder than hell, you know, because I thought he was doing something. You know, that's how, you know, that's where I was. I bounced around. Like I say, I'm still living 1101 Central Drive, and so you didn't have to have a lot, you know. Uh, it, you know all I, you know, needed was transportation to the beer joint. Everything was fine. Uh, I became a hippie about this time. We're getting up to about 1969, and, uh, you know, that's, that's during the hippie years, and, uh, and I was a good hippie. You know, I did everything hippies did. Uh, I met this hippie girl. We got married. We, we were married for six or 16 months. I don't recall which. And, uh, and, uh, and, but I began to get into more serious trouble while I was a hippie. I, I began to get into things that, uh, that were a little, little tough for Mother to get me out of. And, uh, uh, I always had some sort of press credential. You know, as I said, I worked for the newspaper, and uh, when they fired me, I just kept the press pass. You know, I kept the press credentials. And I don't know what happened to it later on, but uh, later on I worked, I moved to Atlanta because that's where most of the hippies lived in 1970. And, uh, you can get what you want to down there. I always liked it. You know, I want what I want when I want it, you know. And, and uh, so I moved down there, and, and I landed the job. It wasn't the only job I had, but I landed a job writing for a magazine down there, so I had another press credential. And uh, I had to leave Atlanta. Uh, I talked to my attorney, and he said, that's the best thing you can do is get back to North Carolina. So I don't, you know, whatever. Uh, that's just the kind of thing. A typical day in my life at that point, uh, I was almost unemployed. Uh, I went to see a friend of mine. Uh, I was probably feeling bad. I needed something to take. And uh, so I went to see him, and he sold stuff that you can take and feel better. And, uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, don't get me wrong. I lived in a lot of trailer parks, and uh, he lived in a trailer park. And and, and uh, so I went down, I bought you know, some stuff, and I figured because I was feeling so bad, I might as well take some of it there. And if you've ever had a tuanol, and I don't like to mention drugs for Podium, but if you've ever had one, it make you a little sleepy if you're not careful, especially if you're drinking a lot of alcohol. And uh, so I was getting ready to leave his place. And if you've ever been to a trailer park, and like I said, I don't see too many rednecks in here, but you, <laughs> most all of them have the tongues cut off of them, you know, so you can drive in between them and everything. Well, I just assumed the tongue was off his trailer. So I backed my car. And the cars I had, I had a two-year-old car at this time. And it didn't have a, a corner on it. They were all kind of rounded, you know, like where you hit stuff, side swipe stuff and everything. And uh, I backed in, the, backed in there to, to leave, and he hadn't cut the tongue off his trailer, and it hit that tongue, and it knocked the trailer off the blocks, and <laughs> water was squirting up <laughs> from the pipes, was squirting up in the air, and he came running out doing this. And I said, I better get out of here. I can't be any help in the shape I'm in right now. So I let, and, and he's a good friend of mine. We ended up working together later on, and he, he'd just laugh about that. But, you know, he had, he got evicted, you know, from the trailer park. Uh, but that was a typical day in my life. You know, I, I hung around that beer joint, and I did those sort of things. You know, that's all I did. Like I said, I was a good hippie. Uh, I was getting a little age on me, and... Uh, and getting in more serious trouble as, as time goes by. And I was in Statesville in jail on a pretty serious charge, and I called mother like I always did, you know. And, uh, by this time, I'm running around with uh, what the big book calls lower companions, and, uh, and, and I've probably served the role to those guys, you know. And, uh, and 
you know, the reason I was running around with these people, I had long since, you know, I I didn't want to be anything around. I didn't want to be around anything that represented good, like my family, my children, the people who loved me and the people that I loved. I didn't want to be around them because I felt so bad inside. And so I was running around with these these good drinking buddies, you know, the camaraderie we have and everything. And, and uh, we got in a little bit of trouble, and it wasn't real serious. It was a felony, but it wasn't real serious to us. But, uh, and uh, they came by the jail cell, and they said uh, they bonded out somehow or another. And uh, they said, we'll be back to get you after a while. And that's been 28 years. <laughs> And I haven't seen them since, you know, but that's how close we were, you know. And, uh, uh, I called my mother like I did, you know, when uh, nothing else worked. Uh, and I said, Mother, come up here and put up the bond I, so I can get out of jail. She said, I can't do it anymore. And I had to get quiet. And I said, she couldn't do it anymore. But, you know, we brought that load on her. You know, I can tell you in about five seconds if I'm going to get fired or get caught. Talk to, you know, and, and, and I'll adapt to it. Well, this time, I knew she was serious this time. The inflection in her voice was such that she wasn't going to do it anymore. And she said, get down on your knees and ask the Lord to help you. And I said, Mother, the Lord can't help me. You're going to have to come up here and put up this pot. <laughs> See, I believed in God, but I was afraid of God because I was afraid, you know, my behavior. I, I grew up in that Baptist church that, I, that was next door to my home. And for whatever reason, I heard that God would punish you if you did the type of things I did. So I figured once I did them, I might as well do them all and, and just keep going and, uh, and uh, work it out later on. You know, Mother told me that, you know, it... it all you have to do is get saved and everything will be fine. And, you know, I didn't know how to get saved. I got saved a lot because every time I'd write a bed check or, you know, something like that, I'd have to go to the altar about six times. Uh, it got kind of embarrassing. You know, people wouldn't even shake my hand anymore. You know, it's kind of like, and so uh, she said it again. She said, get down on your knees and ask the Lord to help you. And, and I didn't know what, you know, I couldn't conceptualize that. Because of you folks, I know today that I can do that. It took you to do that. Uh, and you did it very simply. You know, you just told me your story and told me how it worked for you. And, and, and you know, for whatever reason, one drunk will believe another drunk when they won't believe anybody else. And, and I found that, I found that miracle. But anyway, she didn't come to get me and I sitting there in that jail cell, and I did the first inventory I'd ever done in my life. I said, look at you, old boy. You've had every opportunity ever afforded anybody. You know, the most valuable thing you own is a used electric razor and what few clothes you got, you know. You can't even get your buddies to come and get you, you know. That's, uh, you, you can't, there's nobody you can turn to. And you've blown every opportunity. So I knew from that day forward, I wasn't going to do the things that I did, you know, like hippies do. You know, I wasn't going to do those anymore. I wasn't going to drink hard liquor, you know, because I got in trouble doing that. I thought if I got out of that place, the only thing I'd do is drink beer and smoke pot and do a little cocaine when I could afford it, you know. And with that resolved, I came home. Mother did finally come and get me. But she changed the rules around there. She said, you can't come and go as you please, and you've got to get a job. Well, that didn't sound too good to me. Uh... But she meant it. And so I had to get a job. I couldn't come and go as I please. Went to court. We pleaded it down to a misdemeanor. And as a result of pleading it down to a misdemeanor, I was sent to an outpatient alcoholism treatment program. Now, I went down to this program, and there were about 14 people in it. And I felt so sorry for those people. My God, it was... They didn't have anybody going for them. Now... Mother was driving me down there and picking me up. <laughs> they were driving there. Uh, and I thought if, you know, if, if they just listen to me, I could teach them how to drink, you know, and, and live a good life. And uh, and I got a certificate from that program. 
and uh, it served me well later on. Uh, I kind of, uh, I kind of saw myself as the associate counselor while I was there. And, uh, anyway, uh, so Mother quit enabling, enabling me, and, and she sat me down about this time, and she said, "These folks that I was embarrassed that I was there." you know, for what they did. They were very good with money. My daddy was a real estate speculator also. And uh, they had, he, he and mother had put together a quite nice estate for me and my brother. And mother sat me down. She said, we've cut you out of the wheel. She said, we're just afraid you will kill yourself if you get some money, you know. And, and she was right. And uh, and I understood for whatever reason. And uh she said, we'll leave you this home where we live, the home I was ashamed of, you know, but that's all you're going to get. And uh, so that was good enough, you know. And, and uh, she, but when you lose your neighbor, you got to find another one. So I found a girl. I'd always had some girl. You know, I never could afford an apartment or anything, but, it, you know, I'd find somebody that could, and, uh, and I'd move in, you know, if they'd let me. I got kicked out a lot, but, you know, they'd let me. Sometimes I'd stay a couple years, you know. But uh, I found this girl, and we dated for a while. And then we married. While I was in, while I was doing that inventory in that jail cell, I, I was, you know, I, I changed some behaviors. I really did. And uh, and to this day, I don't think that I've stolen anything <laughs> since that time. I, I can't recall anything. I might have stolen some time from an employer, but uh, other than that, that's about it. Uh, but. Mother cut me. Mother daddy cut me out of the wheel. And that was fine, and I had a good enabler. We we began keeping house, and we got married, and we began falling uphill because I changed the behaviors. But I still had alcoholism because I was still drinking, and I didn't know anything about alcoholism. It was getting worse as time went by, and she began to say things like, "You're gonna have to do something about your alcoholism." Well, this was even a different approach because my first two wives said, "Get out of here, you drunken sob." And this one was saying, I don't want to stay around here and watch you kill yourself. So it was a different approach, and I didn't know what to do. You know, I could, I knew how to handle get out of here, you drunken SOB. You know, I know, I know how to do that. You, you fight or flight, you know. But this was a different approach. And she said, she was insistent, you're going to have to do something about your alcoholism. I tried to show her my certificate that I had from, you know. So what Little did I know that the miracle of this program was already working in my life. She had gone to see some people, and she encouraged me to go see this guy. And she's a marriage counselor where I work, and I'm fine with me. Here's my side of the story. You know, this life may change around here. But by this time, I wanted to do something and didn't know. You know, that, that incomprehensible demoralization that the book talks about so much, that's what I felt almost every day. I was paranoid, I was uh, just, you know, I self-will run right, all those things, and I didn't know anything to do but drink. September the 7th, 1982, my mother was killed in a car wreck, leaving one of my ex-father-in-law's funerals, the, the, the grandfather of my children. Leave, leave the funeral, I killed then. Uh, I, I, you know, I was devastated. Uh, all I could do was drink. I was not part of the solution, I can assure you, you know, during that time. Uh, I wasn't there for anybody. Six months later, my father died. But after meeting this girl and getting, we dated for a while, we got married, we began to fall uphill. They reinstated me into the wheel. And once this money started coming in, I began doing exactly what Mother told me I'd do. I began killing myself. And I'd always thought, you know, if I just had enough money to do this, I won't drink like this. You know, if I could just do this deal, then life would be different. Well, all of a sudden, I had it, and it was worse. And I knew it was getting worse, but I didn't know what to do. I wanted to go to church. And I'd plan on going to church on Sunday, but I'd be too hungover to go. Uh, I'd long since, you know, I'm one of those that probably quit drinking forever over 100 times, you know. Maybe a thousand, I don't know. But I, I used to quit drinking forever for a, a lot. And I knew then that I couldn't quit drinking forever. And I'd say, well, I'm not going to drink till Friday because I want to work every day this week. And, 
and Wednesday would come around, and, and, and I'd feel like it was going to come out of my skin, and, and the rationalization that I would use up here to drink again, and, and then go through that remorse and all that stuff again. And I just didn't know, I didn't know where to turn. I went to see this marriage counselor, and he wasn't a very good marriage counselor. He wanted to ask me about my drinking, and I, and I told him, uh, told him half the truth, uh, which we drunks operate on real well. You know, we can be truthful when we tell it half the truth. I'm mostly honest, and uh, uh, he still seemed to think that was a lot, you know, and, and uh, so he sent me to treatment, and uh, and he gave me a two-week reprieve because I did have some legitimate things that I had to take care of and all that, and uh, and I, I, I hope I never forget that last two weeks, and I, I knew that something was going to happen. I didn't know. I almost didn't go to treatment. That's how frightened I was. But that last two weeks was just, it was hail. I knew I, I couldn't drink and I knew I couldn't do without it. That's the best that I can describe it. And the night before I went to treatment, I did some things I hadn't done in a long time. And I'm going to shut up here in a minute. I'm sorry I stayed drunk for so long, but I hope I said some things that might have uh, hit home. But the uh, night before I went to treatment, I did some things I hadn't done in a long, long time. And, uh, I went into that treatment center and the nurse was asking me questions in, in an intake and she asked me when was the last time I did something and I, out of my mouth came last night. And I didn't mean to say last night because I had a good story to tell when somebody had asked me that. And she said, at least you're telling the truth. And nobody had accused me of telling the truth as long as I could ever remember. And when that happened, a little, there seemed to be a little light. And, and, you know, I know today that that was a miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous working in my life just like it works in yours. From that point on, everything I've ever heard about about this program and about God and about everything has been true. It's made a lot of sense to me. You know, I'll tell you about the power of God's grace. I'm going to do it. And then I'll shut up. When I was a hippie, there was five guys that ran together. We were inseparable. A fellow named Doy Carter, he was, he was, you know, he was just a great guy, compassionate, and everybody loved him. Doy, Doy spent, did three tours of duty in Vietnam, and uh, he couldn't adapt to civilian life. So he went back in the Marine Corps when he was 32 and was beaten to death in a drug deal out in California. Doy had the same disease I had. And there was a fellow named Rick. Rick was also a Marine Corps veteran in Vietnam. Same disease I have. Rick was in this program in and out for a while before, before he died of a massive heart attack at a very early age. Rick was a survivor. I love Rick to death. Uh, we, were, we were at a little bluegrass festival down in Stanley County. Uh, the Earl Scruggs Review was playing, and uh, and I had a press credential for that magazine in Atlanta, and, and I interviewed Earl Scruggs for about 45 minutes. And When we finished, he handed me his card and said, please send me the article. I wouldn't write the article. I was just there killing dime. Well, during that Bluegrass Festival, uh, there was a little scuffle between our crowd and another crowd. And, and the police came by and they said, if y'all get out of here, we won't arrest any of you. We all knew to get out because we had contraband on us and everything. So we got out of there. And we were came home and, and Rick was missing. But that wasn't unusual. Rick got missing a lot, you know, when something happened. And, uh, so we were sitting around the next day. It was about 3 o'clock. I said, well, maybe I better call down to Alport and see if he did get arrested. And I called down there, and the guy answered the phone. And I said, do you have a Richard Malcolm Fly on jail? He said, is that who that SOB is? <laughs> and that was Rick. You know, and I said, yeah, that's him. <laughs> and, uh, and, and you know, he died a very – Tommy Ray, he was the youngest of the bunch. Uh, he was murdered by an associate, you know, a guy who committed murder before. But this is the kind of crowd that people run with when you have our disease. You know, and then there's Wayne. At one time, I've heard since that he's not anymore. I don't know if he got arrested or, or died or what. Wayne was one of North Carolina's 10 most wanted. And he left in 1982 and has been gone ever since. And then there's me. 19 and a quarter years sober in alcohol. So that's God's grace. It's not about God's grace. Any one of them could have had this. But why did God choose me? I don't know. I don't need to know. Only by God's grace am I standing here. See, those guys, you know, greatest, you know, especially Wayne and Dolby, 
they they have more compassion for their fellow man and you know, anybody. Ever. But but their alcoholism would not let them develop those skills. And I think we all have that, you know. You know. So why me? Thank God for it. Thank God for you. You know, if it hadn't been for you, I, I'd have still been out there, you know, just bouncing around. I don't think I'd have been lucky enough to die by now. I'd still just be bouncing around. You know, Dr. Bob says in his story, he says, if you're an atheist, an agnostic, or a skeptic, or have any other form of intellectual pride which keeps you from following these directions, I feel sorry for you. And he's talking about the directions in the doctor's opinion in the first 164 pages of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. This is a man of science said, you know, if you can't follow this program as spiritual in nature, and I really like to say this today because we are talking about this a while ago, you know, this is a spiritual program and, and, uh, and I don't want to get on the soapbox, but, you know, we need to know that more today than we've ever needed to know it. And here's a man of science who says, if you can't follow this program as spiritual in nature, you're in deep doo you know, and that's about as simple as I can put it. Uh, I got divorced when I was five and a half years sober, and, and I, my body ached. I was so depressed. Uh, but God didn't shut one door, then he doesn't open another. And, and a couple years later, another door opened, and y'all heard her a month ago. And uh, we have a we have a home that, you know, we're, we're alcoholics and us. You know, our, our lives, you know, that's the center of our lives, and I don't know. Of any, I don't know anything else, you know.